Hey everybody, Randy Walker here, and uh, I want to introduce our guest for today, La Maurice Gardner, Lama Gord Gardner. Uh, Lama, great to have you here. I met Lama, uh, gosh, I think it was 2017 when I took a visit to the yeah. Wesson Lawn Tennis Club in Pontiac, Michigan, the Grass Court Tennis Club. I think it was the first grass court tennis club that was started in the United States in like 100 years. And then the next year in 2018, we hosted a $10,000 open prize money tournament that we labeled the U.S. Grass Court Championships and uh, got to hang out with uh, Lama when he was uh, working the courts and uh, keeping the courts in great shape. They probably were the best grass courts uh, in the United States. And, um, you know, we've uh, stayed in touch since then. And uh, we've had a lot of great conversations about grass court tennis. And, uh, you know, you're an expert in that. We've had some great ideas. So I thought it'd be a good idea for us to have a chat and you can kind of spread your knowledge to all the people out there are the, the tennis club directors and general managers and club owners and entrepreneurs and grass court fanatics that can, you know, take advantage of your expertise and maybe learn a few things about grass court tennis. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, as you said, you know, we've spoken a lot about grass court tennis. I'm sure I've taught you some things uh, along the way. Um, you know, I was back then in 2017, 2018, I was just, just a basic groundskeeper there, uh, managed to work my, work my way up there at the tennis club. Um, by the end of it, I was kind of running things. So, pretty knowledgeable on the subject. Um, and I went to Rutgers Professional Golf Turf Management for their uh, turf grass program. So got even more knowledgeable on the subject in 2020, 2021. Um, but maybe if you want to start, like, you know, when, you know how you kind of became involved, uh, you know, at Wesson Lawn Tennis Club, you were, you were, you know, in the neighborhood and that was kind of your first introduction to tennis and grass courts. And then you know, you, you, you wanted to learn more and then that led you to Rutgers to get an official degree. Uh, -huh. I mean, it started, if we want to go way, way back, we start when I was, uh, about four years old, I started playing tennis. My mom dropped me in some classes that I started doing USTA tournaments around nine or 10. Um, then, uh, when about 16 years old, uh, the Western lawn tennis club was, was starting its construction back in around 2013 is when they started construction. And, um, you know, as a fan of tennis, I hopped on board in 2014, um, just this little high school kid <laughs> getting in there uh, uh, just just to do something in in the field. Um, and I never left. Uh, I was 16 when I started, uh, finally finished at 24. So I spent eight years doing that. I just stuck around kept learning things over the years, um, kept picking things up. And, you know, as the guy that was sticking around and, and grasping the concepts of it, you know, Bill Massey was, uh, was the owner, uh, previous owner of West Lawn Tennis Club. He, um, said, Hey, I'm going to take care of you. I'll send you off to, to grass school somewhere. So you can, um, you can work on things around here and be the guy. Um, I don't know if he knew he was going to be going off and doing all the things that he was doing, or if he just was just trying to get someone to, to fill that slot, but, um, it all worked out, especially with, uh, COVID coming around, definitely needed somebody that, <laughs> to be there and, and run things. Well, maybe we'll talk a little bit about Bill. I mean, Bill Massey is just a tremendous guy and, uh, you know, founded the, the West and Lawn Tennis Club. He basically, um, purchased a public works, you know, factory, et cetera, and was kind of obsessed with grass court tennis. And he created, was it 22 grass courts that was were there or? We had 24 at our peak. Um, we sized down eventually as the years went by. Uh, but at one point, yeah, we had 24. 22 when you came and visited because we were planning on building the stadium. And, uh, you know, this was, I mean, there was an article in the Detroit newspaper and then in the New York Times and, uh, you know, you know, 
talking about how it was the first grass court club built in the United States in like a hundred years. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that, that Bill was preaching was the fact that the grass was the exact grass as Wimbledon because it was perennial rye grass mm -hmm. and it was the same kind of uh, longitude as, uh, as England. So it was a similar climate there in suburban Detroit than it was in uh, London. But maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what perennial rye grass is versus kind of just, you know, your regular grass. Yeah, so uh, you have two types of grass. First off, you have warm season grasses and cool season grasses. Your warm season grasses are typically Bermuda. Um, a lot of golf courses don't run with perennial rye, but a lot of the sports turf uh, is running for any rye. It's a very strong grass and it also grows back very quickly. I mean, you can take a divot out and I'll put down seeds and two weeks it'll look like nothing's even happened. And um, and being a, a cool season grass, we're, like he uh, said, we're at the 46th parallel. So we're on par with England. So we pretty much look at their their training program out there and run a very similar one. Obviously they have a much higher budget. <laughs> They can afford to replace their grass every year. Uh, ours is the same um, bed every year. Coming back, we just uh, prepare for winter damage and then deal with the winter damage uh, before the next season starts. Um, but other than that, it's all basically the same grass. Uh, they cut a little bit lower. We cut it three eighths um, just because we're not running a couple week long tournament we're trying to run it for the entire year um so we have to be able to deal with the weather a lot more uh, you said it was cut at three eight so what would be like uh what would wimbledon or some of the grass court terms what would they cut it at so wimbledon i believe cuts it at three eights during normal times and then they scalp it lower for their tournaments for for wimbledon um i can't tell you offhand what height they they cut down to um not with confidence but it's a little bit more than half of that um but the, the one thing that was uh, that you know that bill was uh you know, uh, saying to me and to everybody, just the, you know, the durability and the true brat bounce. I mean, I've played on some grass mm -hmm. courts and, you know, basically you hit one, you know, the ball just dies, you know, you can't really hit a ground stroke, but, you know, when, when I was playing out there at, at West and the courts, the, 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 uh, you know, it was, uh, it was still, you know, grass court tennis, but the, the ball bounced a lot more true and you had a lot more rallies and it was tougher too. It was really harder to kind of, you know, get those, uh, you know, scuffs and divots and so forth. I mean, the, all the courts look, look, look pristine, but, but the, the bounce was true and you could, you could have base on rallies. Mm -hmm. This is uh this is one thing that Bill did that I thought was kind of interesting as I was learning at Rutgers um, is that we did it. We did our soil composition a little differently than um, most places in the country do for, for any sports. Most of the time you tend to have a loose soil with uh top dressing sand on top for golf and for tennis, you know. Um, what Bill decided was that he was going to use Michigan's natural, uh, like, hard pack clay uh, soil. We're going to put topsoil over it for the, the grass to grow into. But once it's taken root, we're going to keep that as tough as it is. Now, it made for some uh, some interesting days uh, dealing with water and and wetness on the grass. But uh, ultimately, it made for basically a hard surface of clay with grass on top. So the sublevel beneath gave less. So what would be kind of like for those out there listening that, uh, you know, maybe they have, uh, you know, grass courts at their at their club or they're planning on it, like what's kind of like the maintenance schedule? Like, you know, uh, when do you cut the grass? Do you like, you know, get up at the crack of dawn at five o'clock in the morning and are you on there cutting the grass? I remember seeing you every morning during when we had the U.S. grass courts there. Uh, you know, you were lining, you know, doing new lines and you were rolling the courts and so forth. But just talk a little bit about kind of what a day and what a week and maybe what a month is like, you know, at a grass court facility. So, um, my weeks tend to vary based on uh, what events we had going on. And if you wanted to see an example of how things are run, I mean, you could look at Wimbledon and 
look at different golf courses because they run kind of the same way. You're a little bit more lenient. You're starting a little bit later. And by later, I mean, you know, seven, eight or nine versus five or six uh, on, on weeks where you don't have any events or any tournaments going on. I typically cut every day. Um, that's just how Bill wanted it. He wanted to cut every day. There were times uh, where with weather, if it's too hot, we would let it grow a little bit and just water. Um, and then if it's too wet, because um, we didn't want to put any uh, any marks in the grass, uh, those are the only weather dependent are the days that we would not cut. Because even if we're fertilizing, even if we're, we're watering, even if we're putting down uh, fungicide, all those days we still cut in the morning before doing all of that work. So the first two hours of the day, depending on the crew, um, if it was just me, it'd be the first four hours of the day. Um, so two to four hours of the day would be pretty much just dedicated to cutting. And then the rest of the crew, when I had up to six guys, we would have, you know, one guy would be pulling, one guy would be cutting the long grass on the surrounds. Um, afternoons come around and typically be hot, even in Michigan. It gets to the 90s, um, so someone's usually on the courts watering. Um, or if we have people playing, we'll have them playing on one section. We'll be watering another section. Um, our typical week, other activities in the afternoon revolve around maintaining the machines, keeping up the oil, um, lining the courts. Since you know, unlike a golf course, we have to paint the lines. Those typically start to fade every two days because remember we're cutting every day so when we cut the grass the, the the lines tend to fade a bit faster um lining fertilizing spreading fungicide like i said um then on event weeks things ramp up a lot more because we have a big block of time in the middle of the day where we can't do any of those things because um for the tournament that you at you were at, and then the fifty five sixty that we used to host, that was our, our USCA national. We would have uh, one hundred and twenty or so people come and play. Those tournaments, uh, we we were all full up, so we'd get there four, five, six o'clock in the morning, start cutting, and then typically by six or seven in the evening, depending on when daylight starts to die down, um, right around when the the dew comes in um we'll blow off the lines and repaint them so we can have a fresh set of lines for the next tournament because um or the next tournament day because players playing on the grass will typically also make the lines fade and between those two things that's about the most we can get out of a tournament day we just we're just focused on getting the grass to look good because we don't want to be running too many machines around the uh competitors while they're playing like they want to enjoy their play <laughs> Now, now, what about like, would there be some courts that would be, I mean, uh, 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 like out of play? Like I know when we were hosting the U.S. grass courts that uh, I think, you know, we only used like 10 courts, you know, and then 10 and then like and then the other, you know, 10 or 11 courts were, you know, were 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 resting. And then, I mean, is there like kind of a, a system there where, you know, I, mean, I don't think Bill really had you know, 22 courts going at the same time, but I mean, did, is it kind of like an alternating like 11 one day, 11 the other day, or, you know, using, you know, knocking this row of courts out for a couple of days and, you know, what, what's kind of the process of when a court gets, you know, taken offline? So um, everything is, is based on, you know, as the superintendent, I would see it. And what I see on the courts it would be the determination as to whether or not it could play or not. And the, the great thing about having the 22 courts and why people would always tell us like our courts look so good is because we don't have people playing on the same courts pounding them every single day um like we can jump off from one court to to another we can leave one court to rest like i said we would take two weeks to plant seeds if people put a bunch of divots in them so one court may be not played for two weeks um but that was okay because we had four banks of courts that we could rotate through throughout the week um or throughout the weeks. 
Now, now talk a little bit about also like the equipment, you know, so you and I have had, you know, conversation, uh, you know, about like, you know, the, you know, it's not just like your regular, you know, Home Depot <laughs> lawnmower. I mean, you have to have a, a serious lawnmower and serious equipment for, you um, you know, having grass courts and you and I have talked a bit about, you know, just the synchronicity with golf clubs, but why don't you talk a little bit about what specifically Bill had and what he had to buy, uh, you know, to maintain those courts and a little bit about the costs of what does it cost for a liner? What does it cost for a, a roller? What does it cost for a mower? If you're just having an exclusive grass court tennis, you know, only facility, not, not talking about a partnership with a golf club, but if, if you, if you just have a grass, grass court and no other, you know, uh, 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 mowers or anything as part of the club to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. So the, the most important machines that we had were the, uh, the walk behind, uh, real mowers. So those were about 10,000 a piece. Those were Jacobson Eclipse twos. $10,000 a piece for a lawnmower. Mm -hmm. Brand new. So, um, those got the most use. Um, being the walk behind, it could handle when the grass is wet. You don't want the big mowers on there. So if it rained the night before, you know we'd have the 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 walk my walk behinds going on it. And same thing with if it's too hot, you don't want a giant mower pushing down on it. So those ones got the most use. Um, the maintenance on those is pretty cheap once you get them, though. I mean the the Jacobson's were a pretty high end mower, uh, which I think Bill did on purpose and maintaining them. I had some belts that would break every once in a while, but those would be easy to get to. Um, and then the big mower that I was talking about was a, was a five bladed uh, diesel Jacobson. I think it's a super LF 80 was the designation on it. That was about a $40,000 mower new. Forty thousand dollars for a, a high-end mower. Uh huh. That was the that was the one that you'd see Bill riding around on top of. Uh, that one. It's a lot faster to get the get the courts done with that one. Um, other equipment. The painter that we used was a was a three-wheeled manual push painter. It's basically a bucket with a wheel in that bucket that rolls another wheel that rolls a wheel that stripes the lines down onto the grass. Um, that was around 1500, I believe when he got it brand new. Um, we also had a Husqvarna riding mower for all the, the long grass because for the four acres of, of quartz worth that we had, there's another three acres of, of just long grass outside to, to look just pretty. Just kind of well. barriers, barriers around the courts. Yeah. Uh-huh. So that was i think you can find those for two to three thousand right now brand new um so what's the tab here we got a ten thousand we got a forty thousand we got a fifteen hundred dollar liner we got another four thousand so we're we're talking you know uh, almost sixty thousand dollars at this point yeah i think we're around there and then uh throw another sixty thousand for if you're building the place from the ground up uh, we had a tractor, a Kubota tractor that I believe he also got new that has forks on the front and then a cedar on the back, at least the one that we did. Um, then you got golf carts. I'm not a hundred percent sure on the, uh, on the price of a, a new golf cart or a used golf cart. We got ours from the, the golf course that we actually worked with that was just down the street from us. So we did a we did a little bit of work for them and they would do work on our machines for us because they didn't have the kind of tractor that Bill had. So we get some good deals out of them. Yeah. So one of the things that you and I've been talking about is, you know, you're looking at these costs and uh, well, let me ask you, OK, so if you were going to create a uh, a row of six, or, uh, you know, six or eight grass courts, you know, what would be the from scratch and you were just going to create it right there, not talking about the equipment to maintain it that we just discussed, but what would it cost, you know, per court or per like a row of six courts to create six grass courts? So I put together numbers and I believe that if you had the equipment um, and even 
calculating labor for for putting all this stuff in, I think you're looking at around ninety thousand dollars average for putting in an acre's worth of courts. Okay, so how many how many could you fit in an acre? You think? Uh, you get about six courts in that. Okay, ninety thousand for six for six courts. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, that we have been talking about is, you know, to make this kind of financially viable for a club or, you know, an entrepreneur and so forth is you really have to have access to that uh, grass cutting and grass maintenance um, uh, equipment. And uh, I think you and I were talking about like, I had suggested to you, like, well, what if you if you if you're at a at a at a golf club and you just tell the golf club people, just hey, just make another extra putting green and put netting net posts there, and you have a have a um you know your grass court tennis club. But you even said that it's really uh, it, it really is actually just like having an extra fairway. It doesn't even have to be as low as a as a putting green. So you know, talk a little bit about the comparisons of a grass tennis court to a golf course green or a golf course uh fairway or tee box yeah that's uh that's absolutely right um like when i went through uh rutgers i went to the rutgers professional golf tour golf turf management program so i was there with a class of 36 other people interested in turf but they were all every single one of them into the golf uh field everyone was on a golf course somewhere but we all learned the same thing and um it's my job is sort of easier than theirs was because they had to deal with, like you said, putting greens, which are cut at half the height and are way more subject to disease. The fairways are a lot easier to maintain. You don't have to be as precise on the cut uh, with the uh, with the reels. You don't have to put down as much um, as much fertilizer and and fungicides for it or pesticides. So. All of the things that it would take to maintain uh, the grass tennis courts are is already information that the superintendent and the assistant supers would know at um, at a golf course. And again, all their equipment is the same thing, without the exception being buying net posts and nets and uh, a painter. Everything else is is the same stuff. You can hook into your your same irrigation systems. It's all going to be the standard equipment that you're running with. So if you're comfortable running with rainbirds and Toros, you can stick with your rainbird irrigation and your Toro mowers. If you will have Jacobson's and you have a, an automated system, all this stuff, you can use your own equipment exactly the same as you would use it for a fairway, even easier so just because it's, it's flat. I mean, that would be another added cost um to both if you were to build a place and if you had a golf course is is leveling out the land but again once you have it initially set up you're looking at barely any water and just a few extra hours of labor to cut it to maintain um an acre's worth of of courts so that's basically like you know half a fairway of a short par four <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> uh, you know and that and that's i think is the interesting thing that is if if there are tennis if there are you know golf clubs out there that have vibrant tennis programs um and if they do have you know an acre half acre etc and they have all those equipment it's 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 it wouldn't cost that much more to just add in some grass court tennis club tennis courts um, and, you know, or, or if you're an entrepreneur and you want to, you know, create some grass courts on a, on a, on a, you know, a slab of land, if you're able to find that slab of land that's, you know, in very close proximity to a golf club, you could do a deal with the golf club and say, hey, listen, we'll, you know, borrow, you know, could you borrow, you know, could you mow our grass or, you know, maintain our grass, you know, in exchange for, you know, your members get to play or, you know, or you could just, you know, rent them, which would be a, a whole lot more, a whole, whole lot more of savings than, than, than buying all this equipment. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, like I said, uh, Crystal Lake golf course in Pontiac was uh, very helpful and friendly to us. We, they would use some of our equipment and then they would 
if we ever had any problems, they would maintain our equipment. And then we could also just come to them for advice. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're trying to say you've got a, a spread of brown patch going through any any superintendent's going to know how to deal with that so having people to lean on uh is is super good especially you know like golf is not in competition with tennis it's not like they're going to see you as a threat to their membership even if you don't have any membership sort of agreement um and then like you said a membership agreement uh also works out well i mean i don't know if you've, you've talked to anybody from the western indoor tennis club but uh our members got a discount over there um so we had two tennis clubs that were right next to each other um, coexisting. But, but talk a little bit about, you know, what you experienced with the membership at Wes and Lawn Tennis Club, uh, you know, as far as the allure of grass, you know, I mean, like there's so many people that I talk to in the tennis world and, uh, you know, or just tennis fans, and they would just love to play on grass and have that one chance. And, you know, they'll try to go to, you know, Newport or, you know, any opportunity they have to, to play on grass because it's just something that is so, you know, elusive to so many people. But just talk a little bit about, you know, the excitement that that the membership had at your club of playing grass and kind of maybe what you experienced by, you know, people coming in to play, you know, tournaments there or, you know, were guests and just talk a little bit about the excitement, you know, because it just, it, it 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 does add a lot of value, I think, to a mm -hmm. club, and it just adds a lot of excitement. But just talk a little bit about what some of your experiences with that. Yeah, absolutely. Our members loved the grass. Uh, it was great coming out, especially as I was uh, I was working hard on the grass, and for them to come off and be like they're they're playing great today, long. It was like ah, oh, it's great to hear. You know, it's it's so satisfying to 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 go out on something like that, and. Um, uh, our members, uh, particularly older uh, members, loved it too because um, you had you, you, it's a lot better on your knees. Um, that's one thing I didn't even think about until working at the tennis club is um, that the people come out and play three or four times a week, which wouldn't have people who wouldn't be able to play otherwise on hard courts. It, it just takes a toll on your body after a while. Of playing tennis i'm still young so i don't have to deal with that yet but uh, definitely well, um unless you want to like dive like boris becker on the court <laughs> and so forth but uh but still that's uh you know i mean i think if people belong to you know a clay court tennis club or a hard court tennis club or indoor tennis club and they have an opportunity to also play grass i mean it, mm -hmm. you know you could really you know get get those people to uh you know to uh you know, to play. So, uh, you know, I mean, you and I kind of had a, a business meeting, uh, you know, down when we were meeting in, in Fort Pierce, Florida, when you were down there with your boat and we were talking about, you know, gosh, you know, I mean, uh, Wetson Lawn Tennis Club uh, is uh, uh, Bill Massey, the, the owner, he did sell the club and, um, you know, the status of the club right now is, uh, is up in the air. So we don't know, uh, you know, what's going to happen with the new ownership and so forth. But, you know, you're a free agent and, uh, you know, we talked about like, gosh, you know, you would really be a great asset to, um, you know, some of these country clubs, like if they wanted to add in, you know, four or six or eight, you know, grass courts uh, to their club, you know, or if there's an entrepreneur, I mean, we were looking at land down here in Vero Beach, Florida and thinking, gosh, what if we just kind of put in eight grass courts here, you know, next to XYZ golf club and so forth. But, you know, just talk a little bit about how feasible that is and what you could do and, and uh, you know, do a, do a little uh, promotion for, for you and your services and what you could do for, um, you know, installing grass court tennis clubs, grass court, grass court tennis courts. Uh huh. Yeah, as you said, um, the tennis club is sold, so I'm a, a free agent right now. I do um, just freelance work. Uh, I'm pretty well known in the community around here, so people call on me if they really need any landscaping, grass, or tree work. Um, but the only part time or full time anything that I do outside of here is I do work with the Navy and then I'm a, a sailing instructor out in Virginia. But at the drop of a hat, if a contract comes up in which someone um, needs uh, guidance on this, somebody says, man, I really want to start a grass tennis court here, but I don't know where to start. I can be that jumping off point. I can build you a, a budget, build you a schedule. These are all things that I learned in um 
in Rutgers Turfgrass School and put to use during the two years that I was in charge over at Wesson and would love to put to use again. Um, so I'd love to see grass tennis build uh, what we were trying to build. Unfortunately, the timing is just bad at Wesson with, you know, COVID going on, losing a lot of membership, but um, it's definitely a feasible and definitely profitable thing that you could do. I mean, we had 150 people at some tournaments and we had, as you said, the tournament that we had with you there. And people are really excited about the idea of grass tennis. People are coming from California on an annual basis to come out to Michigan to play grass tennis. So there's definitely a market for it. It's just, you just got to awaken that market. Well, uh, Steve Tigner from Tennis Magazine, tennis.com, he wrote a great article after our U.S. grass courts championships where he talked about, you know, that the Wesson Lawn Tennis Club, you know, could be kind of like the national grass court tennis club and to sell national memberships. And, you know, like you said, people were, uh, you know, we'll fly in from, uh, from, from way out of town just to have a weekend on the grass and et cetera. And, you know, we drew really well for our U.S. grass court tournament. We had, you know, players from pretty much all around, you know, the country and even, you know, players from Canada coming down to play in the tournament. So, yeah, I'm a big proponent of grass court tennis. And I think that really adds value to a club that you can say, hey, we have grass court tennis courts and um you know as long as you know if you have the if you, if you have the budget you know or if you have the grass uh uh uh, uh you know operations with uh with the golf club also at your club it really could be um something special so how can people uh find you llama if they uh want to uh hire you as a consultant to uh, talk about grass court tennis um so my email uh, it's a little funky it's m-a-j-i-c lama at gmail.com um you can find me there um i don't have my business phone number anymore but um you can also find me on on facebook my name is la maurice gardner uh if you're to send me a message over facebook messenger contact me there um and certainly you know, you and I are connected. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, people can reach out to me as well. You know, R Walker at newchaptermedia.com and uh, at Tennis Publisher on uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram. And my uh, business is, uh, website is newchaptermedia.com. So, you know, certainly if you reach out to me, I can put you in touch with Llama and we can get some grass court tennis revival here in the United States and, uh, you know, at your club or at your town or at your facility. So Lama, great conversation. I think people really get a, an interesting perspective uh, here on grass court tennis. And uh, hopefully we can uh, have you creating some more courts around the country sometime soon or, or someplace, you know, around the world too. I guess you're not uh, <laughs> adhere to uh only the united states but uh but thanks for joining us and uh hope to see more grass court tennis uh in the future all right thank you